Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jessica Rodriguez. I'm the Director of Product Introduction and Access at AVAC. Um, AVAC leads a consortium that is working on market introduction of the dual prevention pill with a range of partners, including the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, PEPFAR USAID, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, Population Council and the Catalyst Group, Man Global Health, Medicines 360, HBTN, so a wide range of partners. And so welcome you all to the session on demand delivery and data for decision making, how market preparation for the dual prevention pill is reimagining prevention programs for a future with multi-purpose technologies or MPTs. Thank you for joining us late in the evening. I know it's been a long day for all of you, and it's it's also been an even longer day for many of our presenters and panelists who are in different time zones and unfortunately were able to be here with us in person. Before um, providing a framing and overview of uh, the dual prevention pill and um, all of the work that has happened to date, I'd like to introduce you all to Narazzo uh, Magodi, who is a um, clinical trial trialist, um, renowned researcher who has been conducting clinical trials for the past 15 years with um, women on of reproductive age and on HIV prevention in Africa. She is based at the University of Zimbabwe Clinical Trials Research Center. And I hope she is on the screen and can say a few words as she joins us. Perfect. Um, hello, Jessica, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. It's just before midnight, so greetings from Harare, and I hope we'll have a very interesting session. And thank you to everyone in Montreal and everyone who's across the world who's joining us for this interesting uh, topic, more so for um, African women like me who remain at risk for HIV and who need contraception. So I'm really happy to be co-chairing with um, Jessica here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. Back to you, Jessica. Thank you, Naranzo. And I'm excited to be here today to describe the dual prevention pill, what it is, and why it can be a case study for introducing future multipurpose technologies. At IES 2019 in Mexico City, the ECHO trial results were released, which showed that um, women uh, using contraception had high rates of HIV incidence. And having been there, I can attest there were many questions to the potential of MPTs to be able to address the dual needs of, of women of HIV prevention and unplanned pregnancies. And in fact, in many cases, um, pregnancy prevention is more top of mind than HIV prevention for the majority of women. There was a loud and clear call for the introduction of multipurpose technologies as a solution um, to the result that was shown in the ECHO trial. So what makes a product like uh, the dual prevention pill um, so critical in, in addressing multiple health needs of women and really um, treating and, and, and serving women more holistically? What we do see is that oral contraceptive use has been stable over time in East and Southern Africa, even as new products have been introduced, and even as LARC use, long-acting reversible contraceptive, has increased. Um, you really see a flat line over the last 15 years when you look at the data um, in East and Southern Africa, uh, along with high use in, US, in the US, in the Americas, and even globally. And while oral prep rollout has been slow over the past 10 years, if you look at the data over the past three years, oral prep uptake has grown dramatically in the last three years. Um, and this graph on the, on the right-hand side shows that trajectory and shows um, six countries that have really emerged as um, with the highest prep, cumulative prep initiations. There's also a wealth of uh, end user research and discrete choice experiments that show that women and their partners prefer a user controlled product that um, addresses multiple health needs. 
And um, this is even when faced with choosing between a single indicated product, such as an injection, over a dual purpose pill. So many women and their partners, um, when faced with that choice, would prefer an oral formulation with dual purposes and dual indications versus a single indicated product. And I also feel it's really important to underscore and note that the dual prevention pill is another option. It is not intended to replace or substitute long-acting reversible contraceptives and will be offered in the context of informed choice alongside another, other options that are, that are currently available and alongside available contraceptive methods. So really want to underscore that note that it's another choice and another option for women. This slide really showcases um, current data on HIV prevalence and the total addressable market for contraception. So as you can see from this map of East and Southern Africa, the areas that are highlighted in brown show a significant over overlap between the high unmet need for family planning and high rates of HIV incidence and prevalence. So from a public health perspective, um, a product that combines contraception and HIV prevention can help, again, to address the dual needs of women. Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe have been selected as priority countries for evidence generation. Um, and the reasons for this are threefold. The first um, need, as, as I just stated, uh, there are pockets of high unmet need for family planning as well as high HIV incidence. Uh, demand. All three countries have moderate to high oral contraceptive use. Um, and Kenya has a pretty equal distribution and method mix of contraceptions. South Africa um, leans toward and kind of is more um, focused on inject injectable contraceptive, but still there is moderate OC use. And Zimbabwe has high OC use among women. So what is the dual prevention pill? Um, Beatrice, formerly Mayan, was, who is a company that is the, one of the largest generic suppliers, um, particularly for ARVs as well as many other drugs, they are developing a co-formulated tablet with a 28-day regimen that consists of tenofovir, emetricetabine, or FTC, um, as well as levonorgestrel, ethanol, estradiol. Um, so a combined oral contraception that is the most used COC um, in, in the world. The pills will be different colors um, for the tw first 21 and then the seven days to really distinguish the pills that contain both um, oral contraceptive and um, oral PrEP from those that only contain ARVs or PrEP in the last seven days. These colors are dark pink and light peach respectively, and that is um, that was selected by young women themselves who were consulted and who um, provided feedback on what colors they would be, they, they would prefer. And these colors are more aligned with the color of um, oral contraceptives. The packaging will be a foldable um, blister pack uh, with weekly um, preparations and, and that can be turned torn off weekly so that women um, can carry these more easily on a weekly basis versus carrying the whole wallet pack with them. Uh, instructions will be printed on the back. Um, as I've mentioned, the pillar color and even the blister packs and the packaging uh, were decided and informed by the views and perspectives of young women themselves. And the brand name um, will also be validated with women. Longer term, uh, the Population Council, along with Medicines 360, have, um, have embarked on a collaboration and partnership to develop an FTAF-based dual prevention pill. And this is really encouraging because that would mean that the pill would be a much smaller size and more closely resemble um, current COCs on the market. In terms of the regulatory timeline, Beatrice plans to file for regulatory approval with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in early 2000, 2024, um, and followed by, and pretty much at the same time, will file for national regulatory approval in many countries. 
So the DPP is really positioned to be the first MBT to reach the market since the condom, which is really exciting. There are an array of MPTs that are in early um, stages of, of research and development, but they're about five to 10 years to market. So um, you can see that the, the range of options that are in development, in clinical um, development on the right. And, and the dual prevention pill has the, has the potential to be um, introduced in, in late 2024, 2025, which would be um, much faster than, than the options that are in early clinical phases of development. And the DPP has the potential to generate lessons for future MPTs. Uh, we know that by really thinking through what needs to happen in order to align contraceptive and, and HIV prevention delivery, um, Thinking through introduction for the DPP can help to prepare and prime health systems um, and, and the regulatory uh, landscape as well as financing and procurement uh, for future MPTs that might not be um, yet available. And in fact, by combining two previously approved product, we're products were speeding up time to roll out and delivery and hopefully impact, which is also another advantage of the DPP. It also has the potential to attract a wider array of donors, given the focus on more integrated solutions and self-care. Um, it can attract more, um, a broad range of funders from both the uh, HIV and sexual reproductive health um, space. Breaking down silos between HIV and family planning, which I know has been talked about for, for decades now, might be um, more feasible and, and more, uh, and just faster and smoother with a tangible product. So having a combined product might really be a catalyst for seeing that integration, although it doesn't have to be. And combined, um, a combined product like the DPP can potentially lead to better health outcomes. Um, one pill like the DPP can make taking pills and, and using contraceptive and HIV much more convenient, much more comfortable and safe, and could potentially motivate women to really sustain use and um, can support continuation of the product. Lastly, but certainly not least, the DPP is a woman-controlled um, product. Um, and we all know that uh, it's really hard and difficult to use condoms and negotiate condom use, um, which is the only other MPT available. And um, as women become more comfortable with using a product like the DPP, they might be more open to using future MPTs that are in the pipeline. So as the DPP is potentially the first MPT uh, to reach people, it really can generate critical lessons and lay the groundwork for the introduction of future MPTs. So I'll stop there. I hope that gave an overall picture of where we are with the DPP, um, what the timeline is for, for uh, regulatory approvals and rollout, and, um, and, and what the product is. And happy to answer further questions uh, during the panel. And with that, we'll turn to um, my colleague. Um, we'll turn to my colleague, Warwira Niaga from AVAC. She's a senior program manager who works on the product introduction and access team. And she will focus on the issue of demand and talk to us about who is most likely to use the DPP and how we might engage them. Warira has a wealth of experience, over a decade of experience working on demand generation, marketing, and implementing and designing uh, HIV and SRH programs. And before joining AVAC, she worked at Population Services in Kenya. So I'll turn it over to you, Warira. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. As Jessica has said, greetings, everyone. My name is Warira Nyaga, and I work with AVAC, and I'm really delighted uh, to be sharing with you insights on who is most likely to use the dual prevention pill and how we might engage them more effectively. The insights I'm going to be sharing are informed by a HCD research that we just completed in Kenya, South Africa, Zimbabwe. And we're going to be using these insights to inform the design of the demand generation and marketing strategy for DPP. 
So uh, we used an ethnographic approach which saw us conduct repeated immersion sessions with participants to build trust. And as a result, we were able to unlock deep audience insights pertaining their broader values and um, understand as well how they um, how their decisions are influenced by their partners, uh, their family, and also their and, and also their friends. Additionally, we were able to focus on a holistic uh, view of the audience because we needed to understand when and where they are having conversations about relationships and sex. As mentioned, uh, this work took place in three markets, in Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. The reason for this, uh, Jessica already uh, shared, but what we're really uh, seeking to do is garner more insights in Kenya, which was not part of the initial HCD research was, that was conducted last year and also is not part of the acceptability studies. And then we also needed to fill evidence gaps for South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, So uh, I'll not speak so much to this because uh, Jessica already gave a very great uh, overview. But what is evident is that uh, there's still um, unmet need for both HIV and pregnancy prevention. However, what we are seeing is that there is likely going to be a mismatch between the early adopters for DPP with those that have the greatest need. And the reasons for this is because uh, as research has shown, DPP early adopters are most likely to be the current OCP and or PrEP users. We already know that uh, the PrEP market is relatively small though it has been uh, growing gradually. And what we know from um, DHS um, data, OCP users skewed to urban, older, married women, and those that are wealthier, whereas the unmet need for family planning tend to be amongst the younger and the less um, wealthy. Therefore, there is need to consider launching DPP to early adopters while making sure that the campaign is relevant to those with the unmet need for for, 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 for FP, and then uh, work on it as uh, distribution uh, grows. <clears throat> so um, the participants that we engaged in are very receptive about DPP. However, they still have major concerns in regards to its association with HIV. And also what we are seeing is that even though there is less stigma uh, on OCP, there are quite a number of women that go to great lengths to conceal its use. Another thing we learned is that uh, big life stage and uh, mindset shifts are likely to trigger or provide an entry point for DPP. Therefore, in understanding our end user, it is necessary that we are able to identify these opportunities and leverage on them. So the other thing we've uh, learned is that uh, DPP is going to provide greater choice and empowerment. However, this may conflict with some of the um, gender roles that women adopt, and this could include things like balancing plurality of identities, such as performing respectable roles that the community or their families expect them to do, while also remaining true to what they want, for example, seeking uh, sexual pleasure and empowerment. The other thing we've learned is that it is well documented that the male partners strongly contribute to women's product preference and uh, decisions. However, both the men and the women that we spoke to said that there lies a great risk if women are going to use DPP without you know, involving men or if they do it in secret. Therefore, there is need to start involving men and in doing so, they might be able to create champions that are going to support them. But for the men to be able to do this, then they will need to be educated more about DPP and be involved from the word go. What we heard from the women that we spoke to is that they want information and help that can help them make or use a DPP. Specifically, they spoke to being able to learn more about DPP through safer and trusted channels. They also requested that be, they be enabled to use the pill discreetly. But more than that, they are looking to be enabled in the long run, not to have to be discreet about using DPP. And that is going to be achieved by creating social acceptability around DPP. 
So um, in a bid to start our work on developing the demand generation strategy, we've started um, putting together the some personas. And uh, this is really um, identification of grouping of potential uh, DPP users using behaviors, attitudes, and goals and pain points that can help us shape our communication to them. From ongoing analysis, we've been able to identify five personas or archetypes who are likely to be the early adopters for DPP. But this may change because uh, analysis is still going on and we're going to be building on that. And um, the other thing to note is in our putting together the persona, we have used qualitative data because we don't have quantitative data on the same. So <clears throat> while big life stage and mindset shifts are likely to trigger adoption for DPP, we are seeing that the conversion or the point at which one of the you know potential DPP users makes that decision to adopt DPP will further be determined by attributes that are most important to the user. And also these attributes are very important when we are deciding about how best to position the DPP in the mind of the potential user. So I talked about five potential users and um, the one that has the highest likelihood for conversion happens to be a woman or a cisgender woman who is currently uh, married and is enjoying or looking for enjoyment of sex outside marriage. And um, she is around her 30s and is a PrEP user. And the trigger point why she started using PrEP and the same one that we can use to you know, trigger her use for DPP is when she started having an affair with another man. Of course, this was informed or this was um, necessitated because um, her partner was also having an affair. And when we think about this uh, potential uh, DPP user, in looking at their attributes or how best we can position DPP, then we'll be looking at positioning it as a product that brings enjoyment to her and also helps her with her career goals and uh, you know maintain her social, social status or respectability. The other emerging uh, persona is happens to be a much younger audience who is also in a stable relationship and um, the trigger moment for her to start using OCP was when her long-term boyfriend decided not to use any condoms and she had to look for an alternative or for a product that she can control herself. Therefore, she went to oral contraceptives and um, for her, when it comes to what is important to her, she is more about relationship goals. She does not want to lose her man. Yet at the same time, she'll be looking for a product which she can control herself. Other things that are important to her is enjoyment and uh, career goals. The other person that is also emerging as a potential user is um, also very young, Aban. And um, the trigger moments for this particular um, persona is um, she has left home and she is exploring uh, relationships. She's not having a steady relationship with one person, but her biggest concern is, um, you know, getting pregnant. Again, um, the fact that she's open to protecting herself from pregnancy also gives an opportunity to leverage that to introduce a DPP to her. Like her counterpart, uh, who is um, in her 20s, relationship goals are important for her enjoyment and also career goals. So again, um, that gives a very good entry for, you know, or positioning for DPP. The other person is uh, a woman who is much older and uh, she started using PrEP because uh, she suspected her husband is being unfaithful. The difference between this persona and the first one is whereas the first one is willing to hit back and have a relationship, this one is more cautious and would not even question the husband and she would not even consider having an affair. So she's basically taking prep so that she can protect herself. Lastly, we have new mothers um, that are more motivated 
to you know to space their children and also as they start you know getting into this um motherhood they are motivated to protect their families and um and 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 and, and that also again gives us a good entry because when they are new mothers, then they will do everything that is possible to ensure that they are protecting um, their, their, their young ones and also their family. Like I said, this is just the initial um, analysis for the personas, and we are going to be looking at this and refining this further in the coming days. Um, so the other thing we learned is that uh, information comes from multiple and complex uh, sources. And um, when you look at something like awareness and understanding, for the person or, or for the DPP users, this typically comes from their members of social networks. That could be social, you know, close friends, colleagues, peers, or maybe sometimes observing what their mothers or aunties are doing. And this is supplemented by exposure to communications and other online um, uh, research. Um, Hearing about product for the first time from a healthcare provider is the exception and not the norm in most cases. And by the time uh, our audience are going to the healthcare provider, they already have a good understanding or they, they've already quasi made up their mind in terms of what they want. And the role that the healthcare provider is playing is, first of all, to educate them on the range of the options that are there, and then advising them how to, con to take the product, the possible side effects, and then also, yes, and that. We have not, during our conversations, we did not see any evidence that healthcare providers have been able to change the participant's mind about what product to use. Instead, when they are thinking about switching, this occurs after they've already tried one product or the other, and they've had um, probably a negative you know, experience with them. And um, also the other thing is that um, these potential DPP users use um, social media and other online services, either to review and, and get additional information about the products. And they always come to, back to this throughout their journey or their usage journey from the initial research and um, also to come and also do reviews in terms of what they've had, verification and the likes. But in terms of where they get the greatest inspiration is from their sisters, aunties and very close friends. Um, what we also learned is that uh, the healthcare represents a very tiny part of what our audience is thinking about. And um, as we prepare our demand generation strategy, it's important to know that we are going to be sharing their mind with many other things and competing for that space. Therefore, there is need for us to be able to identify opportunities to connect the DPP to the broader interests of this, uh, um, you know, um, end users such as entertainment, spreading time to their friends and the like. And then the other thing uh, we also learned is that communication has shifted. And I think we've been seeing this, you know, in the, in the most recent campaigns from when we used to, you know, position communication for risk and it's moved on to prevention and protection. And right now it's all about choice and empowerment. Therefore, even as we think um, about um, creating demand for DPP, then we need to go with that uh, mindset. So how might this insight shape how we develop uh, demand or how we generate demand uh, for DPP? So what we learned is that respondents experience duality in their lives, balancing what they want to be with what So the duality comes when they need to balance what they want to be with what the society or their families expect them to do. So one opportunity is to position DPP as the brand which helps the women navigate their two sides, the empowerment versus the traditional. The other thing we heard from them is that women want to be enabled to be discreet about DPP. So again, in 
developing the demand generation strategy, there is an opportunity to position uh, DPP as the brand that is supportive and that helps women become empowerment in secret while keeping up the appearance of respectability. The third thing that we are hearing is that um, the women sometimes struggle with the unpredictability you know, of life. And this is often uh, fueled by actions of their partners. And um, women really want to feel ready no matter what happens in their way. And there is an opportunity again to position DPP as a brand that provides readiness in protecting against the behaviors of others. And finally, there's also the opportunity to position DPP as the brand that is fun to engage with, that allows women to be themselves, explore their sexuality, have fun, be empowered, and the likes. So uh, that is how far uh, we have reached. But even as I conclude, what I want to say is, as we anticipate an additional tools for HIV and pregnancy prevention, we do appreciate that, it, that there is no method that will be the choice for all people all the time. And for one person at all the time. And similarly, even as we think about demand generation uh, and, and marketing for DPP, there is need to know that no one single approach is going to work for everyone. As such, a layered demand generation approach will increase the general awareness for DPP. It will mobilize communities to create social acceptability, which women are really seeking, and also provide tools and support for clinicians and clients to make choices that fit the patient values and lifestyles at a given, not patient, excuse me, <laughs> clients, um, you know, values and lifestyles at any given time. So thank you very much. Um, that's all I have for now. Happy to take questions later. Thank you, Warrior. I really look forward to exploring the personas and, and really delving into the user perspective um, more deeply in the panel. And you provided a great segue to our next presentation, which will focus on provider considerations. And one of the foremost considerations is counseling guidance. Um, and here to talk about that is Dr. Lisa Haddad, who is an OBGYN with um, training in complex family planning. She is currently the medical doctor, doc, medical, she is a medical doctor. She's also the medical director uh, of the Center for Biomedical Research uh, at the Population Council. She leads the clinical development efforts uh, to advance the center's sexual and reproductive health portfolio, uh, including novel contraceptives and MPTs. So thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Thank you. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry, my, I moved too quickly. Uh, so I'm Lisa Haddad. I am medical director at the Center for Biomedical Research. And over the last year or so, I've been part of a subgroup within the DPP consortium to develop provider counseling messages for the DPP. In this presentation, I'll share with you the process and methodology employed by the subgroup as part of this effort, including some applied examples. The provider subgroup was conceptualized in late 2020 as a way to tackle often divergent counseling approaches for oral prep and oral contraception. The goal of this subgroup was to develop recommendations for counseling on the DPP, recognizing that integrated counseling on HIV prevention and contraception is not uniformly performed. More uniform guidance is needed for the DPP, especially on points where counseling for oral prep and oral contraception differ and that lessons learned can be consolidated now to inform tools and approaches to assist and support providers when the method hits the market. With recommendations and representatives from the DPP consortium, we assembled a subgroup of eight family planning and HIV experts with clinical and implementation backgrounds. It was important for us to have strong representation from clinicians within the subgroup because we were tackling topics with implications on efficacy and safety. The initial tenure of the subgroup was from February 2021 to April of 2022. Within the subgroup, it was important that we acknowledge and name the assumptions. Oh, sorry, I think I'm one slide too ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was important that we 
acknowledge and name the assumptions up front, which are listed on the slide here. We wanted to be sure to not reinvent the wheels in terms of what was already there in terms for counseling on prevention of HIV and counseling on pregnancy. First and foremost, we acknowledge that our recommendations are based on the existing guidance for oral prep and oral contraception, where um, guidance for the DPP is not currently available. We also want to be careful that our recommendations are specific to the DPP. So this is once women have already decided that this is a method that they are interested in using and that we're not trying to create new messages for HIV prevention or contraceptive methods as a result. Our hope is that individuals would select the DPP after part of the shared decision-making model with reinforcing informed consent and volunteerism. And this is the method they would be interested in learning more about. We also assume that clients would be eligible for the DPP having received a negative HIV test and also meeting eligibility criteria based on um, in-country recommendations. Oh, sorry, my slides are there. So um, this slide outlines an overview of the methodology followed by the subgroup to develop counseling recommendations. To start the subgroup map, mapped and categorized existing messages for oral contraception and oral prep guidance. This was by uh, evaluating different materials from the WHO, CDC, Population Council, and others, including training tools and training materials and other guidance that are currently published. Next, we organize the information by topics, such as missed pills, uptake, and side effects. We then distilled where guidance overlapped and differed, for each of the topics and identify where we still had questions. Based on the available information and group consensus, the subgroup prioritized six topics to tackle first and to, and to develop uh, recommendations for. Uh, to answer our outstanding questions, we conducted additional desk research and consulted subject matter experts. We formed our recommendations based on all the available information and iterated on them based on the feedback from the subgroup discussions as well as the larger DPP consortium. Lastly, we share these recommendations with the Population Council and study teams working on three different DPP studies. There are two studies that are currently about to start that are looking at the over-encapsulated DPP in South Africa and Zimbabwe, and then HPTN 104, which will evaluate the co-formulated DPP at 10 sites, both in the U.S. and in Africa. We intend to develop tools through this counseling um, guideline that we are recommending that we're pulling together in order to be used in these studies that will help refine them further. This slide is, is an example of step two of our methodology using the topic of missed pills to show how we identified where counseling overlaps and where they di diverge. As you can see, guidance on missed pills is consistent for both COCs and oral prep when it comes to missing one pill. When you take the pill in general and recommending the use of ba a backup method in the case of multiple missed pills. However, the map, this mapping exercise let us, uh, left us with important questions about how to handle miss multiple missed pills, including implications for burden in terms of how long it takes to recoup protection from, for unintended pregnancy, as well as when to recommend backup with emergency contraception or PEP. On this slide, you can see the results of step three in our methodology. We prioritize counseling topics based on the best, um, based on both the available information that was there in the literature and what we found um, through the existing guidance, as well as group consensus on what topics were the most important to address first. Ultimately, we elected and prioritized developing recommendations on the topics listed here, including uptake, drug interactions, side effects, missed pills, discontinuation, switching, and monitoring. Reconciling PrEP and COC guidance for priority topics to develop clear messages for the DPP counseling posed unique challenges with implications for efficacy, side effects, cost, user comprehension, and burden. On this slide, you can see some of the complexity that we face with the topic of missed pills. Depending on the quantity and the timing of the missed COC pills, recouping pregnancy prevention uh, protection can require the use of a backup method for up to three weeks. This is because it takes seven days of continuous COC use in order to recoup pregnancy pr protection. 
In this image on the right of the slide, you can see that there are two missed pills in the third week. If the individual continues with the pack, it would take up to 18 days until they recoup pregnancy prevention because they would need seven continuous days. So as a result, this would require backup during that period of time where they may have to abstain from sex for 18 days. Requiring a backup for up to three weeks is a significant burden on users. And we considered this whether women would um, be able to follow recommendations that are often used for COCs, which is skipping that last week and going straight to the next pack. Then they could recoup the pregnancy prevention quicker. The challenge with the DPP is that this last week is not a placebo week. It actually contains PrEP. And so there's now concerns of cost as well as um, other concerns such as uh, supply. So we had to balance these concerns and figure out whether or not this is something we could incorporate into the guidance. Secondly, we are working through the concept of doubling up in the case of missed pills, which is again a common practice in COCs, but less so for oral PrEP. While the WHO does permit occasional doubling up on oral PrEP, there's limited published evidence on toxicity of multiple PrEP doses in cisgender women. So when developing our counseling recommendation for topics of missed pills, it was important for us to manage these considerations to develop clear and easy to understand instructions. When faced with outstanding and difficult questions to work through, we employed a few different mechanisms to help resolve them. First, the subgroup itself met on a monthly basis to discuss available information and iteratively tweak and reformulate these recommendations. Within the subgroup, we conducted additional specific and in-depth desk research beyond what we covered in the initial mapping exercise. We solicited input and guidance from the DPP consortium partners and the DPP advisory board who are knowledgeable about the DPP, but also have expertise in HIV and family planning more generally. For some questions like those around potential toxicity, we needed to seek additional uh, guidance through expert consultation. And these experts provided contextual information about available study data that they have that may not already be published, as well as their opinions of gaps in the data. And lastly, we presented our preliminary recommendations to the Population Council um, WITS, uh, WITS, as well as uh, uh, University of Mbabwe HIV Institute for implement uh, and implementing partners for the DPP acceptability studies in South Africa and Zimbabwe to ensure clarity and comfort with the recommendations that we are putting forth. While I shared more on the nuance related to missed pills, each topic that we covered had important considerations to manage. On this slide, we lay out some of the more salient points for each of the topics. I'll share a few examples. With uptake, for instance, we had to consider how to align the time to reach protective levels for the DPP in terms of pregnancy prevention and HIV prevention. With discontinuation or switching, we had to manage the risk of HIV and unintended pregnancy when discontinuing the method or switching to another HIV prevention and or contraceptive method. And for monitoring, we have to balance monitoring recommendations with the need and user burden, especially for PrEP naive users who are new to HIV testing requirements. In closing, I want to share some of the collective takeaways on both the process and actual counseling messages that could be applicable to other MPTs. First on the process, we found it extremely important to have both HIV and family planning perspectives with clinical and implementation expertise involved. We know that there's difference between how programs and service delivery plans are designed versus implemented in the real world. And we wanted to have programs that were realistic and informed in approach that could be used to develop counseling recommendations that will actually be useful. We also found it valuable to have working versions of the counseling message to share with trusted groups of reviewers for iterative feedback, as well as access to expertise to help review and hone these messages. To develop counseling message, we need a balance between both the clinical and the implementation considerations, for example, cost. 
we placed a lot of emphasis on considering both the user and the provider burden. So understanding how our recommendations might influence a user's desire and ability to use a method correctly as, and consistently, as well as the provider's workload and level of comfort with messaging on, new me on a new method, especially one that seems simil similar, but has different counseling messages. So whenever possible, we tried to harmonize the messages with the existing messaging for COCs or for PrEP. And then we also, um, we're looking for additional ways that we can use these recommendations and help validate them as additionally looking to potentially work with WHO and hopefully by integrating these messages into these upcoming acceptability studies that are going on with the over encapsulated or the co-formulated tablet, we'll be able to understand how they're understood, how they're used how acceptable they are, and also potentially learn more that we can incorporate into feedback, such as uh, into future messaging. So um, for example, should we learn more about the user's experience with side effects, those can be incorporated in how we counsel in the future. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my fellow subgroup members, as well as the groups and individuals that shared their time and expertise with us as we work through some of the more challenging topics and questions. I would also like to specifically thank Danielle Harris and Kate Siegel for being the conductors and synergizers for this effort. Without them, we never would have found consensus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for uh, your eloquent and elegant description of um, the counseling messages, where they converged and diverged, and uh, the process for how the group arrived at those conclusions. And it's really exciting to see that they'll be tested in the acceptability studies to be conducted by Population Council as well as HPTN. And so we'll move, we talked about users and, and providers, and now we'll move on to cost effectiveness. And I think we all know that cost effectiveness is a salient factor in decision making um, for policymakers, for donors, and, and for users themselves. And I'd like to introduce Anna Burstein, who is Assistant Professor of Population Health at New York University's Grossman School of Medicine, specializing in mathematical mod modeling of disease prevention. And we're lucky to have Anna with us in person tonight. Thanks so much, Jessica. So the motivation for cost-effectiveness modeling of the dual prevention pill is that health systems in sub-Saharan Africa face severe resource constraints. So introducing a new intervention often requires reallocating funding from alternative options. That means that interventions are beneficial only if they provide more health than the money, uh, more health per dollar spent than those alternative options. And so cost-effectiveness analysis is used to produce that estimate of benefits per dollar spent. So naturally, this depends on costs, the cost of commodities, of delivery, of overhead, and its impact on other health care costs. And it depends on health impact. And that is really related to effectiveness, taking into account adherence, as well as the risk profile of the population, which will change over time. And so disease modeling is an important tool for cost effectiveness analysis because it forecasts disease dynamics. It enables comparison of costs and population health with and without the technology. And the results can be compared to cost effectiveness of alternative options. So one of our goals with this analysis was to compare multiple DPP launch populations in terms of their demographics, their family planning use, and their prep use. And so because there are so many variables here, we selected a primary analysis informed by the estimated demand for DPP shown in the graph on the right. You can see that the greatest estimated demand is among current oral contraceptive pill users ages 25 to 49. And so in primary analysis, we chose that group, but we also looked at adolescent girls and young women, female sex workers, and women with HIV positive partners, in other words, in zero discordant couples. And for family planning, we also looked at condom users and women with unmet need for contraception. 
And in primary analysis, we looked at women not using PrEP, but we also looked at current PrEP users, women receiving family planning and PrEP separately, and women receiving them in integrated delivery settings. Um, and as Jessica uh, just said, th there are three countries that have been chosen by stakeholders based on high need, potential demand, and enabling policy and regulatory environments. And of those three, our primary analysis will be in the Nyanza region of Kenya. We also looked at different levels of future epidemic control in primary analysis, achieving the 95, 95, 95 targets by 2030, and an additional analysis with that accelerated to 2025. Um, and then uh, a third goal here was to compare different outcomes from the DPP. Our primary outcome is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. That's the measure for cost effectiveness, and it's the ratio of cost to health impact. So the numerator there is the net cost. So that's the cost of uh, DPP, commodity delivery, et cetera, minus the cost of the oral contraception and, up, and or PrEP that may be replaced by the DPP minus the avoided health care cost, the, the HIV treatment cost, due to people not becoming infected and not requiring a lifetime of treatment. And the denominator is the health benefits, which will be measured here as disability-adjusted life years, or DALIs, averted due to HIV or pregnancy prevention. And additionally, we looked at HIV infections averted and pregnancies averted, and we looked at this in primary analysis over 30 years with 3% annual discounting, with additional analyses 20 to 40 years and 0 to 6% discounting. Um, so here just briefly are some of our assumptions around pregnancy and mortality rates. And I'll draw your attention here in our primary analysis of Kenya to the high mortality rates associated with either pregnancies ending in abortion, 0.185%, as well as the high maternal mortality rates for pregnancies not resulting in abortion, 0.362%. Um, and these are our assumptions related to the costs of different interventions. So you can see here um, we have the cost of DPP for the first year and subsequent years of use. We, we assume the cost would reduce slightly with DPP at scale. Um, and uh, you can see it's just slightly above the cost of PrEP, much greater than the cost of OCP or male condoms. And then lastly, I'll draw your attention to the cost to deliver one year of ART, which is greater than the cost of a year of DPP. So you can imagine if DPP is able to avert an infection and avoid a whole lifetime of ART use, that could help to offset the cost of the product. So this work was done using EMOD, the Epidemiological Modeling Framework. This is an agent-based model, meaning we represent people individually in the simulation. And it was developed by the Institute for Disease Modeling, part of the Gates Foundation. Um, it, it's available online. Um, if, if you choose, you can go and uh, download it. You can check out the user guide for more details. And as you can see, there are many different diseases built into this framework. And we particularly use the HIV component of the model which contains demographics, so fertility and mortality in the population. It contains HIV transmission either via a sexual network horizontally or vertically mother-to-child transmission. It simulates HIV progression and the effect of treatment. And it simulates the HIV care continuum, how people engage in care, and how those patterns change over time. And so the care continuum um, has been greatly strengthened in all three of our simulated settings. You can see here the proportion of people living with HIV on ART in our primary analysis in Kenya, which has now surpassed the 90-90-90 targets. And you can see here in blue um, the assumption of 95-95-95 achieved by 2030, or in red our additional analysis with 2025. Um, so just as a first look at our results, here uh, is incidence among women on the left and male on the right over time. And just first, as a sanity check, if, if we were to simulate 100% DPP use with perfect adherence and efficacy uh, ramping up, um, you can see, just as you would expect, incidence would go to zero in women. And you would also see a decrement to a lesser extent of incidence in men. And that's because men become less likely to encounter an HIV-positive partner. 
And then on the right, you can see incidents in our primary analysis, so meeting demand for DPP among oral contraceptive users ages 25 to 49, the population with the greatest demand. You can see there's, there's a lesser decline in HIV incidence in women and then lesser again in men. So this is our main result, the cost effectiveness of DPP in different populations, settings, and use cases. And in this bar chart, um, the measure here is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, the cost per health benefit. So bigger is worse, smaller is better. Um, and generally, cost effectiveness means um, an ICER in the hundreds rather than thousands or more of US dollars. And so that first um, topmost set of bars is our primary analysis. And you can see that the DPP is unlikely to be cost effective in OCP users ages 25 to 49, which has been the population estimated to have the highest demand. But moving to a population with higher incidence, a setting with higher incidence, can make it more likely to be cost effective. You can see moving to adolescent girls and young women with higher incidence reduces those bars. And then in the next set of bars, you see some sets of bars are missing altogether, and that's because the costs are actually negative. So there's not only a health benefit, but also a net cost savings, um, in this case in female sex workers and serodiscordant couples. And that's because of the treatment costs avoided through averted HIV infections. Um, further down, you see assumptions of DPP at different adherence levels. You can see some bars are missing there, but for a very different reason. Here, we found that DPP could be net harmful if adherence is substantially reduced among OCP users, and that's because the harms of the unintended pregnancies outweighed the benefits of HIV prevention. We also looked at DPP for current oral PrEP users, and we found that the DPP could be cost effective if it substantially increased PrEP adherence compared to separately delivering PrEP and oral contraceptive pills. And part of this is driven by the fact that the incremental cost that we assumed for DPP relative to PrEP was relatively small. Um, if in an integrated setting with PrEP and family planning delivered as separate pills in an integrative way, integrated way, that cost savings is not as large because there wouldn't be the cost savings from the integration. Um, and you can see the results um, were robust to the rate of HIV treatment scale up, the time horizon of the analysis, and the discount rate. These are the additional outcomes of our analysis. On the left, the health benefits in disability-adjusted life years or DALIs averted per 1,000 people using the DPP, and on the right, HIV infections averted per 1,000 people. So you can see the health benefits and the infections averted grow quite a bit as you move to higher risk populations, sex workers, serodiscordant couples. Um, you can also see on the left, in terms of DALIs averted, some of the bars are negative, and that again is that net harm where um, if, if the adherence to DPP substantially decreases, the harm from unintended pregnancies may outweigh the benefit from HIV prevention. And lastly, you see that for current PrEP users, the magnitude of the health benefits and infections averted are smaller naturally, but as you saw, the costs are also smaller incrementally, which supports the cost effectiveness. So some key takeaways from this analysis. For current oral PrEP users, the DPP may not be a cost-effective alternative to OCP in most populations given declining HIV incidence and relatively high adherence to OCP. For current PrEP users, the DPP may be cost-effective as an alternative to oral PrEP with low adherence, assuming adherence goes up on the DPP. And for people at high risk of HIV, the DPP is more likely to be cost effective in populations and settings with higher HIV incidence and may even be cost saving among sex workers and serodiscordant couples. And lastly, the need for effective counseling. We found the DPP could be net harmful if it reduces adherence among OCP users. And so careful monitoring, appropriate messaging, and effective counseling strategies will be needed to ensure informed choice and effective use. There are important limitations to this analysis as well. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, unintended pregnancy outcomes, you saw we really focused on maternal mortality and abortion-related mortality. We have not yet accounted for the health care costs associated with unintended pregnancy, so the abortion costs, the prenatal care costs, labor and delivery costs. Um, we did not yet account for the morbidity or burden of unintended pregnancy other than the mortality. We know unintended pregnancy does have a significant implication for women's health, well-being, and economic status, and that it's associated with a 40 to 60 percent increase in neonatal and child mortality in, in the child that's born. Um, we also did not account for the two to three-fold increased risk of HIV acquisition during pregnancy yet. Um, and lastly, the modeling did not consider the possible self-selection to use DPP while at higher HIV risk. PrEP users we know may self-select for having HIV positive partners, multiple partners, condomless sex, and that self-selection generally increases cost effectiveness. Self-selection with DPP may be different due to its simultaneous role as a contraceptive, and that really highlights the need for further studies to understand risk self-selection. And so I'll close with uh, thanks to many contributors, our wonderful team at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and especially Masabo Milali, the amazing postdoc who led this work, who's in the third row there, and uh, David Kafton, yay, the, the modeler who did these calculations, and uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative team who partnered with us, and the Institute for Disease Modeling that uh, created the EMOD model, and members of the DPP Consortium for their support and feedback. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, for holding forth um, uh, the first part of the um, of the session. So thank you, and I'd also like to thank our speakers, uh, starting with you, Jessica, uh, Wawira. Thank you so much, Lisa, and Dr. Thank you so much. Um, these have been very interesting uh, presentations, and I'm sure they've captivated uh, the audience uh, virtual and in person. And we've heard that um, over the past years, there's been emerging data that women want MPTs. There's no doubt about that, yes. And um, we know that studies have been done that show that women often prioritize their need for modern contraception over their need for HIV prevention. I think mainly it's because of stigma, which can be an issue, and that can create a barrier for many women who need HIV prevention, yes. So now we move on to um, our hybrid session, where we'll have the, the, four, the three speakers, uh, uh, Wawira, Anna and Lisa, and we'll be joined by a special speaker as well in the uh, a special panelist whom I'll introduce just now. So we move on to how can planning for the DPP help us to build platforms for future MPTs, integrating HIV and family planning programs to accelerate delivery of new MPTs with proven approaches. We know that uh, successful integration will require a strong visionary leadership. Uh, it requires a supportive organizational and policy environment. It requires dedicated resources and infra infrastructure and communication is also required. So it gives me, um, before I go on to um, introducing our next, um, our other panelists, I just want to remind the audience uh, that both virtual and in person, you can ask your questions. Um, uh, in person, you can use the mics in the room and submit questions virtually via the chat platform. Yes, so we we'll look forward to having your questions. So um, allow me this time to move to the panel discussion. And it gives me so much pleasure to introduce a colleague, um, 
a colleague, we've worked together with the same medical school. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sam Kelly Sodube. She's the executive director of FP 2030. Samui has more than 20 years experience uh, um, in healthcare, including senior roles in the delivery and financing of healthcare, as well as in parts global microbicides program in Africa. Yes, so we are happy to have Samui here and uh, she will be joining us in the discussion. So I think just to kick this, um, this discussion off, I would like to start with some who haven't heard your voice. We've had brilliant talks from Wawira, Lisa, and Dr. Bishten, and uh, also from Jessica. So, Sam, I would like to start with you. Yes. Um, so, at FP 2030, you have a best eye view of the family planning landscape across multiple countries. Yeah. So, what do you see as the most critical needs for countries to be able to integrate the DPP and MPTs into existing family planning platforms and our current health systems? And I hope, Samu, you will talk about the wide arrays of, um, of the countries, from resourced countries to countries like ours, which are um, limited in resources. and. If you can tell us some indicators, financing, insights, and so forth from recent country visits. Sam? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mugodi. I hope everybody can hear me, and it's great to see you. Thank you to my fellow panelists for those uh, 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 you know, remarks eloquent presentations there that are quite insightful. And again, the audience, I hope everybody is well and greeting from Johannesburg uh, this evening or this early morning. So your question is, is, is important and it's actually timely because we are seeing, especially from Dr. Anna's uh, 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 presentation right now on, uh, on, on, on the science, like modeling, what science actually say, and the previous speakers as well, you know, we've, we've heard from Lisa what, what people say. I love the one from Moira about the personas and uh, the archetypes of who is going to actually use DPP. So, Dr. Mugodi, I think the first, the most important thing for me is the human centered design. When we are looking at how we can introduce DPP, integrated care is actually important because most of the countries and recently uh, we've just visited the DRC, uh, we've just visited Namibia and Botswana, where we saw clearly why integration is important. And as countries are moving towards their national health insurance programs or universal health coverage programs, this actually becomes important. But I think the question is, who then should we integrate for? And I think what Dr. Anna was speaking about, where we need more than ever before to be driven by evidence, to be driven by science in terms of our focus areas, looking at, at, at women, where the incidence is higher, where the risk is higher, when we are likely to get the cost effectiveness. I think that's important. Our best eye view, we can see the need then for integrated care in there. We see that for us, in, to do this more effectively, we need to better align, especially the needs of those who are marginalized. So Dr. Mkote, I always say, you know, at times we need our services to be packaged for the people so that we don't say hard to reach individuals, but rather our services often are the ones that are not easy to reach. They are hard to reach, not individuals, it's the services. So in addition to the cost concerns that drive many government decisions, we must consider this human perspective. No one wakes up, whether young women or, 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 or men or even young people, no one wants to only prevent pregnancy. People want to move as we were, you know, just eloquently, you know, uh, 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 told the story, stories from Kenya. Preventing pre pregnancy is a means to an end the means to attain a happy, fulfilled life and, and perform more in your career. It's the same with HIV. No one wakes up and says, today I want to avoid contracting HIV. This then places the issues of MPTs, DPP in particular, to ensure that they squarely sit on what the woman needs. And yes, when people go to the doctor or go to a, a practitioner or a provider, these needs are treated separately. 
And the nurse or a doctor makes assumptions often and decides what to recommend. I think human-centered design is going to help us more and more to somehow avoid that. Now, the drive towards harmonizing or integrating HIV prevention and family planning, it has been going on for a long time now. And I'm glad that as I'm joining this sector again, I'm finding progress that is being made. So the global movement towards UHC in particular is adding that impetus and that agency that we should leverage uh, uh, from. But many countries are still struggling to ensure that methods mix, the robust mix of contraceptive methods that are to be available at any health center. FP2030 does country commitment near us or end. In the country commitments, we look at method mix. And I think that's where many countries are struggling. This, for me, actually places DPP as an opportunity to expand method mix, particularly countries that are struggling with HIV, because condom actually has been the sole dual method of protection. And now moving to DPP, that for me is expanding method choice even more. So this is important that we add this one intervention, but ensuring that where we introduce it is more more cost effective. Again, this similarly applies to in Namibia and Botswana where I was, I was recently. This actually is squarely on the table and I think those countries, again, you may need to be speaking to government so, so there. We also have, uh, uh, and I heard again, uh, one of the speakers mention, you know, this gender that we need to be, this actually uh, includes or encompasses Populations from various spectrums, it could change the lives of LGBTI people, people living in poverty, young people, as we say, that this would appeal to adolescents. And also it would appeal if a provider, for example, sees a cisgender married woman in his office, he might be unlikely to prescribe a dual protection option. But what if she has multiple partners? What if it's the persona, the archetype A, that's what we already spoke about? And what if the husband does? And I think that it's important for us now that so many groups, especially young people, people with multiple partners, LGBTI people, they all have a pointed need for DPP, but they are also most at risk for not receiving them due to provider biases. And the work that we're all doing around providers and ensuring that they could train more, I think for me then is important here. Four years ago, the ECHO trial demonstrated that even women who desired and used highly effective long-acting contraceptive methods were still high at high risk of HIV. And in DRC, where I recently traveled, you could see, and this is data from their recent DHS survey, women are, are three times higher, like the young women, they are three times more likely to acquire HIV than men, men of the same age, especially the age group between 15 and 24. Now, the oral contraceptive pill is one of the most common contraceptive methods that is used in DRC. As you, you and again, DKT, partners like DKT, they are, they are, they've released such data with one in five contraceptive users reporting that they use the pill. If these users use a dual protection pill instead of the traditional oral contraceptive pill, the results on HIV prevalence in the country could be astounding, and we need to do, to, to do more. We must follow science, Dr. Mugodi and everyone in the room. The science tells us that we must invest in DPP and more of the MPT. But looking at those who are covered here today, and I'm just appealing and you know, to, to those who are, are advocates in the room, you shouldn't be alone. Those who are in Montreal, you shouldn't be alone. We need the likes of uh, UNFPA on board, and I'm sure they are already on board. We need pharma around the very nuanced way that we actually gain market access. Gilead, everybody on board, government, and I see that there is work that is going to happen with, the, with FDA, the regulatory authorities to come on board to help us with innovations that will end HIV and, you know, we help us in the unmet need for family planning. We are talking even over 160 million, you know, unmet need for family planning globally in the recent Lancet article. And we need all hands on deck to ensure that we can hit somewhat two beds with one stone to the population where this matters most. So I thank you for mm -hmm. the work that has happened so far. And thank you so much for the, to the other panelists for their eloquent presentation. Thank you, Nyarako.
Sure. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Samu, Dr. Dube. So um, what I'm hearing from you is we need to engage with policymakers, regulators, civil society, key opinion leaders uh, in HIV and SRIH to generate buy-in, shape introduction in, in um, integration plans. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that eloquent response, Samu. Um, Jessica, uh, could I, um, could I pass this on to you, Jessica? Yes, thank you, Narad. So, and thank you, um, Samu. I think I was really struck by when you said um, it's not people that are hard to reach, it's the services that are hard to access and the products that are not so easy to use and, and MPTs might be a way to sort of um, address that. I did see someone in the audience uh, with a question, so wanted to turn to them to ask a question. Hi. Hi. Um, this is really exciting to see that this is going ahead and to see all the advanced planning and thinking about how to introduce this product. Um, it's fantastic. My question's for Anna. Um, the, the, the missing piece of, of this cost effectiveness analysis, I think, is the, um, the costs of averting unintended pregnancies. Uh, which is huge. Um, we know that there are multiple costs. And I was just wondering if you have plans to introduce it. I know it's hugely complex, um, but if you have plans to work that into the model. Good. Yes, absolutely. We, we have, uh, we're very excited that we do have plans to address some of these limitations. So first of all, taking into account the cost, the healthcare costs avoided around unintended pregnancy, the abortion, uh, antenatal care, labor and delivery, as well as the morbidity, not necessarily mortality, but the, the morbidity and the quality of life costs of the unintended pregnancy, um, as well as the, the potential mortality of the child, which is higher with an unintended compared to a, a planned pregnancy. Um, and then the, the additional piece that we hope to address in future work, which I think is going to be really critical, is thinking about women's ability to self-select for risk. So th there's a, quite a body of modeling of the cost effectiveness of oral PrEP, much of which has concluded that it is not cost effective in most populations. But a recent paper that came out in, I think, Lancet HIV or Lancet Global Health, I've forgotten, by uh, Andrew Phillips, looked at this question of uh, what if instead of really trying to actively target PrEP, we just made it very easily available, low barrier, and we allowed users to try to self-select for risk, so only using oral PrEP in periods of time when they're having condomless sex with a partner of unknown status. And um, his work actually showed that it could be cost effective in that mode. And so uh, that's a, a really interesting question with the DPP because there are dual motivations. So women may have a monogamous negative partner and just want to avoid pregnancy at times and then have a, you know, a, a condomless sex partner with unknown status that she perceives to be a risky partner at other times. And you know, how can we cost effectively allow women to switch and to have that uh, flexibility, taking into account all of the issues that Lisa discussed about not finishing a pill pack and the wastage um, or you know, it, with inconsistent use if you uh, you know, switch from one to the other. Do you have to take yesterday's pill if you skipped it and, and all of these complexities? Um, so there's so much to learn and we're so excited to get to model that. Awesome, thanks. Thank you for your question. Uh, we also have another live question, so happy to take it. Yeah, um, hey, I'm Kim from York University. Um, thank you so much for the fantastic session and wonderful presentations. Uh, my question goes to um, Dr. Uh, Lisa Haddad. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you can describe a little bit more about the process of incorporating patient perspectives and then what are important for users um, as part of developing your provider's counseling session. And I think uh, first speaker, uh, Raira, very nicely, comprehensively described the evidence that uh, the message of empowerment um, seems very important to users beyond the clinical effects. Um, so I'm wondering how you can um, um, make sure that the message and, um, can be a part of the provider's counseling. Thank you. So thank you so much for that question. I think you are 100% correct in that. And what we've done so far is to start 
the process of developing counseling messaging. And part of our next steps are gonna be introducing these messages within the context of these trials of people who are using. Understand what they hear, what they need, and what they their understanding is with it, with the messaging that we're coming up with. And this is not gonna be addressing all of the aspects of counseling around the DPP that we're gonna be dealing with here. The, some of the biggest and most important aspects that we haven't even touched on are going to be how are we going to integrate the DPP within the broader method mix for family planning and HIV prevention. And that is not something that the provider group is doing. And that's something that's going to take quite a bit of work really to help to integrate it in a way that we are ensuring is unbiased, that we're in integrating it within the context of what we can promote in a shared decision-making model so that people are offered the choices. And I think Dr. Dubé really highlighted some of the biggest challenges with, it, with the integration of family planning and HIV care and specifically where the NPTs are falling in. And I think a lot of the counseling messages are gonna be at the level of the end user, really in understanding how we can combat some of the challenges that they have in receiving the services that they want. So we know a lot of that has to do with the provider. And so how can we enable the provider to give the messages to end users so they can use the methods that they want in a way that they don't receive bias, that they don't encounter any sort of coercion, and that they also feel comfortable in receiving it. And that has to do with where they access care as well. And so we're gonna continue to iterate on these messages over time in order to really bring that voice of the user in. Over, over to you for the second question. Sorry, if uh, my, my my apologies, if uh, the speaker could just come back again, my internet is a bit, a bit erratic. I was changing over. So. Uh, th Perhaps while the speaker is coming back, well, well, Wawira, I had a question for you. Let's uh, have Jessica have uh, the speaker come back on. I just wanted to find out from you, I enjoyed listening to the HCD research results. What surprised you most about the personas uh, and the insights from your research? Yeah, so Jessica, I don't know whether this, uh, the other speaker is back. If we could have the repeat question and also Wawira could uh, maybe go into the insights and uh, the personas. Those were very interesting. Thank you. Over <laughs> to you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Narazzo, and uh, apologies that I didn't get the previous question. I'm hoping that I'll get it and respond to it. So um, a couple of surprises for me uh, when we're going through this, and um, the thing that really surprised me is uh, not the fact that um, we were, when we were interacting with the um, participant, they were very open, especially women about, you know, their infidelity. But what was um, really surprising is how they talk about it. The men talk about sexuality and the infidelity in a very open and casual way. But increasingly, you know, something that we've not seen in the past, the women's are coming up and talking about the sexuality to an extent that they want to take revenge on their men that are cheating. And uh, some of the um, statements that they were using, um, especially in a place like Kenya, is that if I find my man cheating, I want, you know, draw for draw or tit for tat. And that is what informed, you know, the first persona who is, uh, you know, going to take prep because uh, she's hitting back at the, you know, the partner for cheating. Something that has not, you know, women have not talked about in the past. And for me, the key takeout for that is that um, the society, especially the women, are ready to talk about, uh, you know, matters sexuality right now. And in our positioning for, you know, for DPP, then we can tap into that opportunity and, 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 and frame communication for pleasure, for enjoyment, you know, away from when we were always, you know, hiding behind, um, you know, women don't talk about these things openly. The other thing that um, surprised me and not very much, but then it just uh, confirmed how much sociocultural context influence the reasons behind the motivation and the influences. 
Um, so when we were speaking to the women across the three markets, one of the things that came up as, 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 as key is they all want to be seen as respectable, okay? But digging deeper, we really needed to understand what's the meaning of respect for these three different kinds of women. You know, the ones from Kenya, the ones from Zimbabwe, and the ones from South Africa. And we found something very interesting. In Kenya, respectability is tied to moral sanction. So I will be respectable because their society expects me to, you know, to be respectable. On the other hand, in Zimbabwe, uh, respectability is tied to tradition and being submissive. You know, it's a very different, you know, context. And then in South Africa, respectability was tied to social status of marriage. You know, so even as we think about communication, it is very critical that we understand the social cultural um, context so that we are framing communication to reflect those uh, cultural uh, realities. Thank you. Thank you, Awira. Jessica? Thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly repeat the question to Awira. Um, so, my question was that. What your suggestion maybe suggestion with thoughts about how to best use your insights from patient perspectives or user perspectives, such as the, the important message of the empowerment can be incorporated uh, developing providers guide, guideline for the counseling sessions. Okay. okay. All right. So um, we did um, actually when we're doing our research, we did um, also dig and engage the, you know, the providers in terms of uh, what are some of the, you know, the challenges that they might have in prescribing a DPP to some population or for, for particular uh, context? And what we are going to do is uh, we're still synthesizing that information and those findings are going to feed into the team that is uh, working on the, you know, uh, in, into the counseling um, uh, tools just so that we can make sure that um, our providers are well equipped to be able to engage these uh, you know um, users effectively additionally I think this um, insights will also go a long way in helping us you know kind of um, determine what kind of training the providers need because one of the things we've understood is there are biases that are informed by you know the respective you know um, you know, personalities of the healthcare providers, and they have to be addressed. So we are slowly, you know, um, churning out those insights, and they're going to contribute to the tools and also the capacity building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warira. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. We do have one last question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, I'm Robin Schaefer. I'm with the WHO Global HIV Hepatitis and SDIs programs. And I, uh, we just heard about uh, cost effectiveness, and obviously the costs are a major determinant of cost effectiveness. So I wonder whether, whether you, Anna or Jessica, uh, whether we have any understanding of the cost of this product from the manufacturer already, you know, whether it's just going to be adding up the cost of two individual products. Are there any synergies potentially in the manufacturing process that make this cheaper? Obviously, it all depends on demand, et cetera, but do we have any uh, understanding how much this pill will actually cost when it comes to the market. Thanks. Great. So for this analysis, we were fortunate to work with our partners at Chai, some of whom are here in the audience who have really been uh, tracking this, what are the cost of the different active pharmaceutical ingredients, how much might cost go down as the product scales. Um, so that, that the, the per tablet cost would come down. And that helped to inform the costs that were presented. But uh, I'll note that actually a cost driver for the DPP and indeed for oral prep is the delivery. So about three quarters or more of, of those total costs that you saw were the delivery costs, in particular for oral prep because of the need for ongoing HIV testing to avoid inadvertent use of those drugs um, in HIV infection, um, as well as um, the higher cost in the first year to avoid toxicities, the lab costs. 
Um, so we, we assume that those costs would carry over to the DPP because it would contain the same active pharmaceutical ingredients as oral prep, and that is really going to be the cost driver. So um, in addition to thinking about how to reduce the product cost, I think um, a very welcome innovation would be thinking about how to reduce prep delivery costs, whether that's through very low-cost self-testing that could be delivered with the product um, or other ways um, to make that delivery less burdensome and costly. Okay. Thank you, Anna, and thank you everyone for attending uh, this evening in person and online. Um, I, I would just want to close with a, a comment that multipurpose technologies have the potential to really revolu revolutionize um, healthcare services um, because not only are there products in development for HIV and pregnancy prevention, but also other STI prevention, and it can be available for, for and, and helpful, beneficial to so many different populations. And we're really hopeful that uh, there will be bioequivalence results in the next few months that can be shared. And um, we're really embarking on a very comprehensive comprehensive market preparation uh, strategy that, as you can see from the remarks of all of the panelists, really uh, incorporating end user perspectives and values and experiences, um, really thinking through delivery challenges and opportunities in terms of integrating uh, HIV and SRH services, thinking through uh, the cost and cost effectiveness um, and what that means for, for decisions and trade-offs for policymakers, um, as well as providers, their biases, their needs, um, how to empower them to really counsel and ensure that products like the DPP um, reach reach users. And uh, so really want to thank all of our panelists, thank um, my co-chair, Narazzo, for uh, co-chairing the session with me so brilliantly. Uh, Warura, my colleague, um, Lisa, who's just been um, such a brilliant mind to have on the consortium, Anna um, and, and Samu, who were just so fortunate that you could join us, and you've been uh, so, so supportive, and it we really are engaging SRH stakeholders as part of this process and uh, so fortunate, Samu, that you could join us and, and gave a, a testimony for why the DPP and other MPTs are so vital and a vital addition to expanding the, the method mix for HIV prevention and for contraception. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Kate Siegel, who organized this session, who rallied all of us and, and, and uh, kept us organized and, and really please everyone on applause for her, applause for all of our panelists and for all of you for staying so long tonight. Thank you. <laughs>